So uh, hey guys, it's Nitrous here and welcome to Under the Rose. Today we have a very familiar guest. I want to welcome Johan Todd Merla to the show. Hey! Hello, how's it going? I'm good, how are you? I'm good. Okay, so uh, before we start things off, could you please introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Johan Merlo. I'm also known as Todd in the gaming world. I'm 29 and I uh, played Warcraft 3 for many years as a professional gamer before moving on to StarCraft 2 where I play and cast as well. Okay, awesome. Uh, so I want to get to know you as a person. How were you growing up? Uh, were you the kind of person that was shy and ke um, kept to yourself kind of person? Or were you the more extroverted and how does that compare to yourself now? Yeah, I think uh, growing up I was pretty shy uh, for most of my youth up to a certain age when I started being more uh, outgoing, you know, talking to people and all that. Uh, I wasn't really someone that smiled much and uh, I was like, how to say, uh, not very like focused, you know, like I easily lost focus and started like going to my own world and thinking a lot about uh, different things, so, like whatever I was passionate about. And uh, yeah, later on, changed a lot more, I tried to, to refocus a little bit better uh, on the moment and uh, yeah, now I think I'm I'm a lot more outgoing. Like uh, this, actually yesterday I went to an opening of a new meltdown bar in France and uh, I talked to a lot of people there very, very easily uh, without a worry. Whereas a few years back, uh, this would have been so much harder. Alrighty, um, so what would you, um, what would the do Todd today say to the Todd of 10 years ago? Uh, <laughs> I don't know, uh, maybe just try to try to live life a little bit better, enjoy, because uh, not, not only that, you know, not only was I a lot more shy and not nearly as outgoing as now, also, for example, I didn't, I think, appreciate things as much as I do now, like, for example, I travel a lot for tournaments before I never really went sightseeing. Whereas these days, every time I go somewhere, I try to maybe go a little bit earlier or stay a little bit more after the events to do some visiting. You know, I went to Battlegrounds Washington and made sure I visited basically pretty much everything there was to visit there. I went to the White House, uh, Lincoln Memorial, Washington Monument. So uh, I think it was pretty cool. And uh, yeah, in the past, I think I didn't do that enough. When did you decide to make esports a profession in your life, and were your parents supportive of that decision? Uh, when I was when I was really young, many many years ago, about I guess more, maybe even over ten years ago, uh, I was already playing a lot of games, and I was really passionate about it about Warcraft Three. And uh, when that game came out, I started playing very seriously with. Uh, with the plan on trying to go pro on it. And then uh, I had some mixed, mixed success at first, but um, just I, I, I stick with it. And then uh, after some time, I finally started getting some better results. I got to go to Korea and join uh, the legendary Four Kings team. And then that's really where my career took off. I went to WCG, finished third, and then from there, uh, became one of the best in the world. So my parents didn't really support it, but uh, I didn't really give them a choice on whether, like, I, I, th I feel like I'm a very different person than most people. Uh, then again, you know, I don't really hang out with too many people that are completely exterior to esports. But uh, when I watch movies and stuff, there's always like these children that like do whatever, or like a lot of what their parents tell them that really want to make them proud. I mean, as much as it made, would make me happy to make my parents proud, it, never really was, was my priority. I always wanted to do my own thing and be happy with it. And then from there, they can be happy for me or not. So I didn't really give them a choice and I decided to do my own thing. And then later on, obviously, when I started earning uh, money, they, they started supporting me. But at first, yeah, obviously, they, they weren't particularly uh, against it. They weren't the parents the most against it either. Like They didn't tell me, like, you really can't do that and stuff. Uh, I totally see. So you said that, you know, you moved to different countries and you stayed in different countries I mean was the culture shock any was it surprising to you or was it you know totally different from where you were staying from 
Uh, it was very different, but it wasn't too much of a shock because uh, whenever I travel, I do like a minimum of research. Like obviously, like when I went to live in China or when I went to live in Korea, I knew uh, not to expect the same thing as friends. So uh, I wasn't too shocked. But uh, yeah, sometimes there was stuff that was hard to adjust to, like the food most of all. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's funny actually because I just saw an interview of State, mm -hmm. the American player that lives in Korea, and uh, he. He basically mentioned in his interview the same thing that I had when I was in Korea, where like if you stay there for like many months and you don't eat any Western food, like you have these cravings or like you need to eat Western food, because like it's very hard to only eat Korean food. So yeah. I had similar things like that. Also, I, like I miss some of my friends. Uh, obviously, like when you go to a country like Korea, uh, for me at least, I was Warcraft 3 Pro Gamer, I was spending a lot of time practicing. It's hard, like you don't get to hang out with friends too much. Usually you won't have that many foreign friends, even though things changed over time. And now there is like a lot of foreigners in Korea. So, yeah, it's not always easy. But uh, as long as you prepare mentally, like I believe a lot in mental preparation for everything, even for tournaments. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so, um, what would you say is your greatest achievement inside and outside of gaming? Uh, inside of gaming just to have this long career during which I managed to make a living out of gaming and living from my passion. And I guess outside of it, I guess we'll have to be it too, sort of, because uh, I don't think too many people can have the chance to live from their passion like I do. So even like if you if you don't look at uh, my career like as a sports in itself, like as, as a regular person, like to, just to, to get to live from my passion, and I guess also to travel, to have traveled like so much of the world. Like I've been to so many countries, so I feel like this is like not an achievement, but like a great experience that I got to live and that I'm so happy about. And um, what got you into gaming? Is there any favorite childhood games? Uh, when I was very, very, very young, actually, when the like Nintendo, the 8-bit one came out, uh, I got it for Christmas and already I was playing, I think it was like Teenage Mutant Turtle, which for me was like the hardest game ever. Back then I got stuck at some point and never finished it. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, already from there, I was really into video games. Like later on, I moved on from uh, platform to platform. I, I played on like Mega Drive, Super Nintendo. I played a little bit of everything. But when I started playing on computer, I felt like that's when I really discovered like video games how I liked them. That's when I discovered RTS with Command and Conquer and all that. And later on StarCraft, Brood War. And then I, from, then, from there it was over basically. I knew that RTS was going to be my passion. Yeah. And so what does esports mean to you? Uh, well, it's just uh, kind of like my, left, my lifestyle, my dream, my passion. Uh, I guess my life. It's an easy way to say it. like my life is sports and uh, it's been for a long time and I think it's it's going to it's going to be uh, still for a long time hopefully. Yeah, and uh, you know esports has greatly changed in the entertainment scene. You know where do you see esports in about probably five years? Uh, it's very hard to 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 see actually. Like uh, for me, I'm so immersed in esports that. I don't really see it as an outsider's point of view, as like this big growing thing. And actually, you know, uh, yesterday I was again at an opening of a new bar and I got to talk about it with a lot of people. And they were telling me about how they think esports is like exploding, you know, with Walls finals being in a stadium, like a huge audiences showing up to so many tournaments, prize money getting out of control. Like there's such huge prize money, uh, like across many games and in a lot of tournaments. So, I, I'm really not sure. I hope it will con keep on growing and uh, continue to, to do so and there will be even bigger prizes and more people watching. Um, in France, there is actually, uh, every once in a while, they have like these media talking about esports and they always kind of discredit it. And I saw somebody make a very pertinent comment recently where they say that uh, the, the regular media, like TV and all that, they are competing with esports. Like, obviously, they're not going to go on TV and be like, hey, check out Twitch. Like, you can see so many gamers play games and it's so fun. And 
like people will do it and then they start watching that rather than TV. So they're competing with it. So of course they, they have no interest in promoting it. So uh, I really hope this somehow can change at some point and then esports can completely take off and become a lot more mainstream, kind of like in Sweden, you know, where it's on TV all the time. Yeah. Like on Sweden, they have esports on TV all the time. They, they have dream lights there and stuff like that. Yeah, and uh, so, I mean, did you see the League of Legends uh, crowd? It was pretty big. What did you think about it? Uh, I watched yeah a little bit. Uh, I think it's very impressive. Um, I think uh, Riot they worked very hard to to achieve this. Like they they picked the right country. Obviously, like League of Legends is like super popular in Korea. It's like the country. They put their world finals there. Everything seemed good about it. The stage they they used uh, Imagine Dragons as a band to make one song and sing there. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. Like every. Every work that they put into this is what made it so good. And uh, you can tell that they are probably the most involved company that makes video games uh, in esports. And I really hope that others are going to follow, you know. Yeah. Blizzard started, started getting really a lot more involved yeah. with WCS and with games like Heroes of the Storm on the way. I really hope that they are going to try to basically match up to, to Riot and, you know, and Valve also. With uh, Dota 2 tournaments and CSGO tournaments that they've had, they, they, I think they've done a pretty good job. The international is, to me, so crazy that there could be a tournament with so much prize money. So I, I hope it will continue and I hope all of these companies will uh, continue to try and uh, hold such big esports show. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we were talking about StarCraft. Do you ever you remember in Brood War where it was like OSL and MSL, like the crowds are huge. Do you ever think StarCraft will ever be like that as its former, you know, predecessor? Uh, I, feel, I, I feel it seems difficult because uh, like Brood War was like the first thing in Korea. It was like the game where like people got to watch and like they picked a player they liked the most, which when you had guys like Boxer, Yellow and like all the all those heroes, like all the guys that, that were like super popular playing, wasn't hard. Mm -hmm. um, like in StarCraft 2, there is really no equivalent. Like it's so, how to say, it's never the same people winning. Mm -hmm. Like every once in a while, you're going to have like Teja or someone winning two or three tournaments here and there of, uh, across a few months. But if there isn't like a player like dominating, it's very hard for people like to pick a favorite, really find an interest in following them. So right now this scene is like, it's it's a little bit strange. Like StarCraft was like the esports game for some time, and then suddenly a lot of people moved to other games. Mm -hmm. And now the people who are left watching StarCraft, I feel like most of them, they are not really playing all that much. They are they like to watch the good players, but they don't like to play as much. So it's not like this community where there is like a massive um, amount of people playing the game that will also watch it, like on on the MOBAs, like Dota 2 and League of Legends. It's more of like this community that keeps on playing it because they like the game, but not nearly as big as mm. for the as for the other games. So it's yeah. All right. So uh, you know you've been in the esports scene for a while. Do you ever do you enjoy casting more than you enjoy competing? Uh, a while back. I always would say that I enjoy playing more, but I think nowadays I enjoy casting more. Like watching these, uh, watching the top players play, like uh, Zest, you know, Classic Hero, all these guys. Every time I get to cast their game, I'm just, I'm just so happy. I'm like amazed that I get to cast these guys. I feel like I'm so fortunate mm -hmm. to uh, get to do this job, and uh, yeah, it's it's been nice to cast uh, as many tournaments as I did this year. And to cast like such high level players that every time I cast, even though you know I try to do some analysis, just kind of predict what they will do. They just play so well. It's like oh my god, like I can't believe they can do this. Yeah, and uh, so you know, <clears throat> you were in a lot of uh, competitive scenes, gaming scenes. Which one was the most pleasurable one, and which one was the most stressful one? You mean uh, from different games? Yeah, for different games. I mean, I only played uh, Warcraft three professionally before, mm -hmm. and then uh, and then Starcraft two. Like other scenes, you know, I play occasionally, and I got some friends in, but I don't really know. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure. Like it's very different. Like for example, in Warcraft three, there was like a lot of unwritten rules. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, if you beat somebody, 
you could not go and shake their hands. It was considered very bad manner. Whereas in StarCraft 2, the winner comes and shake your hands. So for me, like it was a big shock. There is a lot of things like this uh, that kind of make me prefer the Warcraft 3 times in terms of like mannerisms and stuff. And uh, yeah, it's also very, very competitive in, on StarCraft 2. That's also, that also makes it very difficult for me to keep on playing competitively just because I don't deal with losing very well. So like I will get very upset and like, like I said before, my life literally like is StarCraft 2 and esports. So if I'm losing, then obviously my life is like kind of ruined and going bad. So it's it's very difficult for me to handle. My world comes crashing down and I get very emotional. Mm. And you know, how do you relieve that kind of stress? Do you, is there anything you do in your free time? Uh, I try to do a little bit of uh, running here and there. I think it's very important to always have one game also to take my mind off StarCraft 2. So it, it kind of always changes. Uh, up until recently, I was kind of bored of every game. And today, actually, yes, I picked up uh, Heroes of the Storm. So I think I'm going to do that for now, mm -hmm. uh, from now, to try and relax when I'm not playing StarCraft 2. Uh, yeah, I think that's the main thing, to at least have one other thing. And for me, it would be like sometimes going for a run or doing a little bit of workout or playing another game. So you were talking about Heroes of Storm. Uh, have you any favorite characters or anyone that you like playing right now? Uh, yeah, Rainer. Rainer. I've been playing a lot with Rainer, and I, I couldn't unlock it at first because I didn't have like the credits. I wanted to earn the credits to be able to unlock it. So I played Diablo, mm -hmm. and I thought it was really bad at first. I was like, "Oh my god, this year is so bad!" But then I figured a, a little bit uh, how it works, and I think it's really OP. Both of them. And it, it's the only two heroes that I play, so maybe I don't know anything. Yeah, it's about the game, it's hard to say. Yeah, so do you see uh, a future in Heroes of the Storm, or do you think it'd be a big esports compared to like League of Legends and Dota 2 and StarCraft? Uh, you mean for myself or for the game? Uh, for the game, just in general, like, do you, where do you see its yeah. future? I mean, when I first played the game, I didn't really like it, to be honest. I played it when it was first playable, uh, I think it may have been at the last BlizzCon or something. Mm -hmm. And then later on, I tried again one game online and I didn't really enjoy it. But uh, I, I played a few games today and it was really enjoyable. I actually didn't see time pass by. That's also why I came late for the interview. So, um, yeah, I think it has potential to be uh, really big in esports. And I think Blizzard understands the importance of putting a lot of effort into making this game work. I mean, it's a boba by Blizzard. Like, how crazy is that? If you think about the characters, like you got so many Blizzard characters in the game, it's so fun to play. There's like the same thing as in all, as in all the MOBAs, like skins and all that. And you know, I was very skeptical too because it's very different than any other MOBA. Like you know, experience is shared. Uh, there is no like items that you buy. At least not as far as I know. So I was like, oh my god, like what is there to do then? But there is so much to do and there is so much action. Like on the map, it's crazy. Like uh, today, I really got into it and. I feel like there is so much strategy and team play, especially like team play seems so important. If your team just like doesn't pay attention to you for one second and somehow the other team has better team play, you will lose every single time because they'll get the important camps or like coins or whatever like the map is about. So uh, I think it, the game has a lot of potential. Yeah, and was it nostalgic for you to see? Because I know you were uh, competing in Warcraft. Was it nostalgic to see some of the old characters like Chen and uh, some uh, Arthas? Yeah, uh, actually the first time that I played the game, I played with Arthas. And that one, I don't think was too great. <laughs> so now I've been using StarCraft characters a little bit more. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's, I, I feel like I need to try a lot more characters because right now I really don't know that many. Mm -hmm. uh, I've played against with and against Zeratul, mm -hmm. like uh, on my team and against me, and uh, it seemed kind of in bad. So, uh, and people in the lobby were telling me, hey, you play Protoss, like, why don't, why don't you play the Protoss characters? They are OP, like, in the real game. So, <laughs> I think I will try that next. Yeah, and um, so speaking of Warcraft 3, you were pretty successful. Do you still play the game from time to time? Ah, uh, no, never. Yeah. It's... Yeah, it's not a very good feeling like to be so rusty in a game, so I never really bothered playing it again. Mm -hmm. um, I was asked many times actually to play show matches or like fun matches with other players, but most of them, you know, like Ruby, you know, they played much longer than me. I think they would, they would probably stomp me, so it wouldn't be fun. <laughs> so I declined every single time. Uh -huh. um, 
But yeah, sometimes I kind of think about the game and all that. And I saw that Robbie actually was doing a lot of commentaries mm. on his on his old Warcraft 3 game. So I offered to do some with him. And we did uh, one of my games recently that he posted online. Mm -hmm. And we plan on doing another one of us playing 2v2 in like some epic games that we had a long time ago. So it's it's nice. Yeah. And, uh, you know, did you have any friendly rivalry in Warcraft 3? Uh, friendly rivalry. <laughs> Is there such a thing? Uh, I had, I guess, I had a little bit of a rivalry with uh, Grubby because we were like the top two European players, mm -hmm. and then later on with Hot, a Ukrainian player who also was on my team, and who also was like one of the better European players. I guess these guys. Uh, also with Sky. Uh, I just want to mention it always. It wasn't always friendly. <laughs> We had a rivalry, which sometimes was friendly, sometimes not. But uh, yeah, also with Sky, I guess also with Moon, and uh, I guess that's pretty much it. So, uh, you know, in the professional gaming scene, we're just talking about rivalry. And uh, also, there's been, you know, a lot of players tend to have dark times in their careers. What was your biggest struggle in esports, and how did you overcome it? Uh, when I went to Korea to practice, uh, for quite a bit. Uh, I, I wasn't really sent to any tournaments and then the tournaments that I got to play in, I did okay, but like, they they weren't like real tournaments. Like, it was really weird. Like, for example, I went to IPL and then I played the uh, Squirtle in the first rounds and he finished second in the tournament and then I dropped to lose the bracket and I played um, July Zerg straight away. So, I, I barely lost to both, actually. I lost one and two to each, and like Squirtle went on to take second, so it was like a pretty satisfying result, but they didn't see it this way. So like this was a really bad time for me, because I know that they weren't satisfied with my performance, and I ended up leaving the team like not on so good terms, uh, because they wanted to lower my salary, which, you know, in StarCraft 2, it's very hard to have players that are consistent. Like, I can understand that they weren't happy with my performance, it's just the way that it happens. So... This was a really dark time for me. Like I thought a lot about quitting. Like I went to Korea to practice very hard, and then I got to play in some foreign tournaments, but very few of them. And then I kind of like messed up in some of them, and in some other I did okay, but didn't really have any impressive results. Like it kind of felt like my practice took some time to kick in, and later on started uh, affecting my play with like all of the, the experience that I had gained. And I, I really feel like I wasn't really given the time to show all I had practiced for. So, uh, yeah, this was probably the worst time that I had. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, in regards to StarCraft 2, what caught your attention to move over to SE2? Um, actually, after I retired from Warcraft 3, I wasn't planning on being pro gamer ever again. Uh, but my friends, like, they asked me many times to play StarCraft 2, so... I was doing other stuff for quite some time, but then I guess around one year after the release of Wings of Liberty, I picked it up just for fun, just to play here and there as like a relaxed game. But uh, I started losing, and then when I lose, I always want to play more. So I played many hours, and then I started getting good. And then from there, I just joined the team and basically became pro again on the game. Actually, I, I had a very fast progression rate when I first started StarCraft 2. Like uh, I started and the game was already out for one year, but like after two weeks of training, I was like already on par with like most best French players. And then after one month playing, I, attend I attended my first tournament in France and we had some pretty good players. And I took second already. Mm -hmm. So I had a very fast progression. But then after that, I kind of like stagnated a little bit, didn't do so well, had some up and downs. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, who would you say is the most underrated player in France? Uh, I'm not sure. I think Psyonic, uh, it depends on the rated where. Like in France, we know our scene pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, but like may maybe like in Europe and the world, like people like Psyonic, you know, mm -hmm. uh, is, a, is a very good protocol that's in Grandmaster. I don't think he's rated very high in the European scene, but I think he's good. Um, Marine Lord is starting to be rated better, but is uh, is still a lot better than people will uh, give him account for, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, that's pretty much it. Those two, I guess, also uh, T Drogo, 
a Protoss that uh, went to my Insanity house to practice. Uh, I played him, uh, actually there was a tournament in my city just not long ago, and I lost to him in finals, and uh, I think he was playing really insane, so I think it's good. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> you know, like, uh, so I know you and Roddy have a pretty interesting relationship with each other. Uh, I know you visit his house a lot. How crazy does it get in his house? Uh, I mean, in the house itself, not crazy. It's him. It's him who's crazy. Uh, <laughs> everywhere that he goes. Uh, yeah, Roddy is somebody that I've known for a long time. That's just the best word to describe him is a degenerate. Like I don't understand how this guy is still alive. Like every day for breakfast, he has an energy drink and a and a Snickers bar. Like it's unbelievable. Uh, yeah, like he's one of my closest friends. And uh, he's been for a long time, so it's always nice to go and visit him. Like, he never say it's so, it's so crazy. He never says no to me visiting, too. Like, I asked him if I could go visit now, like, very soon for, like, two weeks. And he's like, yeah, sure, no problem. <laughs> and then I, I tell him uh, what day I get into LAX. And I'm like, you want me to super shuttle it? He's like, no, I'll just come pick you up. It's like one hour and a half drive for him. So it's just, yeah, he's just, like, a very good friend and uh, a little bit crazy at times. <laughs> Doesn't really bring it home too much. I guess like the craziness, like he, I can't think of anything like too crazy that he does at home except maybe let me sleep on a terrible air mattress that has a hole in it <laughs> that I would wake up in the middle of the night, it'd be empty uh, or fair. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, yeah, that, that's that's a funny story. The last time I went there, um, because like me and Roddy, like we've been like all over the place, like literally, I think it was maybe 2006 or 2007, I was living in China and I had like a massive flat. And he wanted to come to China to play some tournaments. And I had to leave to another country to play one. So I, I literally like gave him my apartment keys and he stayed at my place for like a, a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, later on in Korea, I was offered to cast the Warcraft 3 tournament. And I told him like, if you, I, I would like to have a co-caster. I would like Rory to be my co-caster. You can take some of my pain, give it to him. They were like, okay, sure. So I housed him in like the smallest apartment ever this time, like literally like five square meter out of five. So we we had no we had to share a mattress, like it was super small. And later on, it was him who started housing me. Like now that he's in the U.S. and he has his own apartments, whenever I go visit. But the thing is, I didn't always treat him super well. Like as I told you, like we were sharing mattress and stuff. So now when I went to to stay at his place, he didn't really put any effort into accommodating me that well. So he gave me like this old mattress that had a hole in it. <laughs> and that basically was losing air over time. So uh, after like three hours sleeping, I would wake up and like my rib would be like touching the ground and it would hurt just because the mattress was getting empty. Didn't really give me any clean bed sheets and stuff or towel that I, I had like to kind of manage myself. And he gave his chair and like his, uh, the extra desk that he has to Nathanias. So then in the end, I took like some crappy chair and a table that they bought that Nathaniel built himself. He took two hours and he did the worst job I've ever seen at building a table. Like literally, like if you push it a little bit, it looks like it's going to fall. <laughs> so uh, as friendly as he is, like he's, he doesn't really feel like he's the best host. But it's funny because Bomber, before I think it was season maybe one or two or something like of this year, he wanted to stay. In, uh, in America rather than go back to Korea before he had to play round of eight after he played round of 16. Mm -hmm. So he came to Roddy's place. And this time it was like the king had arrived. Roddy gave him his bed, his room, <laughs> his computer, his speakers, everything. And he then stepped in the hallway on the floor. I was like, what's going on here? Like, what's the difference between Bo and me? Why you treat him so well? And, like, you did nothing for me. And uh, I guess he had no answer, but uh, I know it's this way and uh, I'm fine with it. Yeah, Roddy's just a good friend. Yeah, and speaking of good friends, you know, you're over in EU. Is there anyone that you're pretty close to as well? Uh, not not like uh, with uh, Kevin, I think. Like there's a few people that I like in the community, but it's hard to like relate as well to them. Mm -hmm. And like most of them, I guess, I'm not really like as hardcore StarCraft people, you know, they would be like real life friends or people that I've known for a very long time uh, that live like near me and stuff. Like in gaming, I have friends here and there, you know, it's just like friends, like not like, you know, a close, super close friend or best friends. Yeah. 
And uh, so this is going to be the fun question and the final question. And um, what if the world was being taken over by monsters and you were to choose five pro gamers or casters? And take note, they could be uh, active or retired, doesn't matter. Um, so you can choose five to save the world. Who would you choose and why? Uh, well, I guess Roddy, because he's my best friend and I don't want him to die, even though he's probably going to bring us down <laughs> and take some stupid decisions. <laughs> So I'll pick him. Uh, Mr. Bitter is a bro too, and uh, he can he can do some smart things against all odds. Um, we need some muscle, I guess. Maybe Slivko or Titan, one of the Russians, mm -hmm. would really help with that. Um, we need a brain. <laughs> I'm not sure who that would be. Maybe. Maybe Flash, I guess, mm -hmm. even though the, the longer age barrier wouldn't help. <laughs> um, yeah. And then what, one more, I guess? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, maybe Deshi. Deshi. Because even, even during tough times, he would cheer us up with uh, his, his young and innocent, naive brain. <laughs> so, so joyful. Uh, young little guy <laughs> <laughs> alrighty so um, is there anyone that you'd like to give a shout out or a thank you to? Uh, my team mostly XMG mm -hmm. uh, thanks to them for sponsoring me and uh, shout out to everybody who gave me work this year in casting tournaments I really appreciate it I think it's been a really fun year and I hope I get to cast more tournaments and uh, shout out to you for being patient <laughs> And not being angry because I was late for the interview. No, it's totally fine. So uh, I want to thank you, Todd, for your time. And I also want to thank you viewers for watching. So tune in the next week for the next installment of An Under Rose. Bye, guys.